Welcome to the Brighta European EdTech Virtual Tour France. My name is Hege and I'm Head of Community at Bright Eye Ventures. It's great to be here this afternoon on the fourth stop of this series event. So far, we've learned from talks with amazing EdTech founders and investors in the Nordics, in Spain and Portugal, and in Germany. And as well as a small teaser, we'll be doing Greece next on the 26th of May. But today it's all eyes on France and we have arrived chez vous. We'll be talking with a great lineup of regional, uh, global even, ed tech experts. With Donoclas, Erika from OnDeck and Anne Charlotte from EdTech France, who will discuss disruption of higher ed and lifelong learning. All in conversation with, introducing our very own David Guerin. David's prepared some really hard questions, but we also want your questions. So please post in the stage chat as we move along and we'll pick up as much as we can for the panels. But without further ado, the floor is yours, David. Thank you, Hege. Thank you very much. So hi, welcome everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm David from Brighta. It's great to, to meet you all. Um, I've been looking forward uh, for, to this session for a few weeks now uh, because we're very lucky to have great people joining the conversations today. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Really, thank you. And obviously, thank you everyone for joining the session. I'll start by sharing a few words about BrightEye and then we'll move to the first uh, fireside chat. Um, so BrightEye essentially is the largest edtech fund in Europe with two advisories. So we have one office in London and one office in Paris. We invest at seed and series A stages in companies that are mainly based in Europe. Our investment thesis is fairly simple. We look for solutions that help people learn and grow. And one very important uh, piece of this uh, investment thesis is around internationalization. This means that we only back companies that we strongly believe um, have the potential to scale across geographies. So that's very important to us. Um, that's it for BrightEye. Just a quick note for housekeeping before we start. Um, this is, as uh, Hege mentioned, this is a, an open Q&A. So please, guys, feel free to share your questions in the chat and we will get to them. Um, now, let's start with the first conversation uh, on disrupting the higher ed and le lifelong learning spaces. For this conversation, uh, we have complementary guests. Uh, so let's welcome Erica, the head of international expansion at OnDeck, Mary, CEO and founder of Econoclass, and Anne Charlotte, CEO of EdTech France. So welcome, guys. Thank you, David. Hello, yes. David. Hi, Mary. Hey, guys. Erica is, is arriving. Yes, hi, Erica. So, hi. guys, uh, I'd love to start with your background. Please share a bit more about yourselves and, and your company. That would be great. So if you want to go first, um, Erica, for instance, let's do it. Thank you. Uh, such an honor to take a cup of this panel and, and great to see everybody uh, today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Erica. I work at OnDeck. Uh, it's a new modern education institution where I lead international expansion. And before that, I was uh, seven years at uh, the family building up the European startup ecosystem. Uh, I was the first employee there and, uh, and director. And then I'll pass it over to Marie. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Erika. Thank you, all the Bright Eye team. I'm so happy to be here today. So basically, I'm Mary. I'm the CEO and founder of Econoclass. And Econoclass is a sales uh, school. So it's, for, uh, it's after your baccalaureate or when you are just um, a, a guy or a girl who wants to be a, a superstar uh, sales. Cool. Thank you, Mary. And Charlotte, you're next. Yes, I'm next. So uh, welcome. To, to, I'm very happy, sorry, to be here. And uh, I'm actually representing EdTech France, which is a NGO promoting EdTech in France. It's a network of EdTech companies that are working uh, on the K-12 uh, market in higher ed and in professional uh, uh, education. And we are now more than 300,000, uh, sorry, 300 companies. And uh, we are relying on a big network of uh, partnership also, uh, which are uh, business schools, companies, and uh, big media that are interesting into innovation. So very happy to be here. And many startups are actually uh, working with David. Marie is a member of EdTech France, so it's family here. Great, great, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the, these uh, great intros. Yeah, you're right. It's family. Uh, look, um, first question uh, for you. Let's start with you, Marie, if it's all right. Is 
what is your perspective? I mean, it's a question for the three of you, right? But is what is uh, what are your your perspectives on the on the current state of the higher ed space in France or beyond, right? So what's working, what's not? Any challenges that you guys are seeing or insights that you would like to share? Yeah. Okay. So I have to start. Uh, I think we have uh, an evident move in re in Europe, but in the world, it's online um, online education. So we did the move with Econoclass. Uh, at the beginning, we were a physical school. Um, yeah. Right now, we also have an online school, and inside the the online uh, curriculum, I think we have two uh, big parts. You have the coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. who, who, like the, the coaching right now I think with the pandemic is so so important people needs to be um, to have someone with them uh, to learn and to ask questions and uh, communities uh, I have the, the feeling that um, people need communities even if it's online so yeah basically it's kind of my feeling on the market right now Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Okay, interesting. Really like the community side of things. So that, that's great that you mentioned that. Um, Erika, what's your take on, on the current state of the higher ed space? Thank you for that question. I mean, um, a lot of people call on like, the, the Stanford of the... The funny thing is that we have nobody on the team that actually went to Stanford. <laughs> but... Um, if you look at kind of the history of universities, they they have three main value. The value proposition is three main things. It's um, the credential, the network, and the knowledge. And um, I mean, if you look at different markets, uh, the the I mean, the U.S. Uh, they've they've nailed kind of the credentials, especially the top universities, yeah. and uh, and sometimes the network. But but the problem is that it, it has become inaccessible, right? Um, I remember this last week. There was a tweet by a top Ivy League school that was bragging about their acceptance rate being the lowest that it's ever been. Like they're bragging about how many people they exclude, right? And then um, the other thing that educations are failing, uh, education institutions. Are uh, failing I, I think today yeah. is the um, continuous learning part like the education part uh, you know preparing people for the real world I think Coursera um, started really well they did a great job in, in you know like training people for you know continuous learning and for for modern skills but it was it's missing the the network aspect and 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 I think in, in certain extent the credential you know even if, if you know a diploma from Coursera it, it means something but it doesn't have the way that that you know other institution could Got it. Wow. Thank you. A lot to unpack here, but that's that, that's great. Thank you, Erika. And, and, and Charlotte, what, what's your take? Yeah, I, I will just add that uh, now, after one year of uh, uh, COVID-19, it starts to be a priority for uh, the French government to actually yeah. help public university to switch to a digital uh, way of uh, teaching because I'm speaking with a lot of business schools, a lot of startups, and they understood how important it is to uh, help teachers uh, use digital tools and to help mm -hmm. students learn through digital. But public were a bit late. And since March, actually, uh, public, uh, the, the public uh, ministry actually um, launched sorry, a call for a university uh, to give uh, 10 million to every public university that was able to uh, have a, a strong project uh, based on ed tech startups. So the, for the first time, the French government recognized the, the strength, the power of uh, ed tech companies, private companies, to help public universities to switch to digital. So I think it's it, it's a great success, and it's because of the crisis. And uh, this is a, a big a big move for France to help the public uh, higher head to switch to digital. This is great. So the the the, the, uh, the ed tech uh, France uh, members must be must be a uh, thrill and Charlotte, I guess, right? The the guys that are also a lot of work because every university were coming to saying, okay, I need a tool to do that. I need a tool to do that. And I was like, okay, I have 10 companies doing that. Could you be uh, a bit more pre precise, please? So yeah, it was a lot of work, but uh, at tech startups were super happy. Yeah, I guess so. Please, uh, do you have any specific products, uh, areas or companies that, that, that you, well, in this specific space that you'd like to share? I have a lot, but I just want to, to stretch on two aspects. 
uh, that yeah. were uh, recurrent coming from uh, business school and uh, university. Uh, first aspect was uh, about the exam, online exam, how to be okay. able to conduct a massive exam for thousands of students in a very uh, nice way for students and also reliable, reliable sorry, in terms of uh, data. So that's, that was the first area. And the second one was about the social aspect of a virtual class, how to uh, engage students, how to communicate with them. Uh, for example, like a, a company like WooClap. Uh, so th th this, is, uh, this was the two uh, biggest aspects, evaluation and uh, social, social aspect of uh, teaching. Thank you, that's great. Okay, thanks for that. And Mary, Erica, it's a more question for you guys, but um, Essentially, I would love to, to, to know though, to, to understand what are uh, Econoclast and OnDeck doing differently from traditional universities? And, and to, to what extent do you consider yourselves uh, as competing with traditional universities? I know it's a tricky question, perhaps, but uh, we would love to get really your thoughts there. Okay. Um, with Econoclast, uh, we are competing because we do the same job uh, as university. So we educate our country and uh, especially after the baccalaureate. And what's different, I would say, quite everything in, in, operation, <laughs> in operations. Uh, so basically the first difference is uh, in, in, at Econoclast, we train uh, students for a specific job in shortage. And we, we, we feel that, that we hold them a job. So they are not here for a diploma, they are here for a job, and that's I think our job uh, as a school. Uh, then we we train we train them by the practice, so they mm -hmm. really practice uh, the job. So our students really, um, I, I mean, they are operational when the, the sorry when they graduate because we don't have diploma, but when when it's the end of the school and they are. Uh, it's it's like it's like the the very first job in the company. I mean, they can say they can practice the job. They are operational. Um, our school is is five times uh, shorter than a classical okay. curriculum, and I think it's a super important point that maybe we can talk about later. And then we mix uh, every age, every background, and I really think it's uh, important uh, at school like the mixed city. Yeah. Thank you. And, and actually, that's interesting what, what you're mentioning, Mary. It's the fact that that you guys are so focused on on placement of, of your students. This is a massive difference with traditional universities. I mean, I'm not saying that traditional universities are not here to they are here to prepare obviously students to get a job and and to be prepared for for the the the, the, the labor market. Let's put it this way. But um, but that's true that they do not usually track this this uh, placement rate that you guys do. So that's uh, that's that's a great and and and, and massive difference, I would say. Um, what about you, Erika? Um, yeah, so I maybe to set the stage because I didn't really explain what we do in the intro. Yeah. But um, at OnDeck, we build um, programs for people who want to launch their ne next company or the next phase or project in their career. So we launch programs. We have seventeen programs uh, for founders, uh, for creators, uh, like podcasters and writers and for different sectors uh, within tech, uh, so FinTech, um, health, um, et cetera. And for, for people who have uh, specific functions within a company like chief of staff, product, design, et cetera. And so the idea is that we gather a cohort of 150 people who are all going through the same thing or have similar objectives. And then we um, kind of accelerate the serendipity, uh, the connections, and we develop sessions in a curriculum for, for those people. So so I think the the thing that people compares to most is, in, is the MBA because of the kind of you know typical persona that we focus on, which is experienced uh, people. And you know it's in the US it's it's a no-brainer for a lot of people because it's a uh, you know 150k versus you know a couple thousand dollars. Uh, you know the math the math on the, on, the, on that side is clear because also people that have done both an MBA and all that think that they 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 got most about more value from from the other pros and that's not me saying it it's it's our it's our our fellows, but I guess that the 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 main difference would be that you know I, I mentioned those three things you know the credential the network and the and the and the education I think that we focus so much more on the network and not just you know a way of like I, I came to this school but we are we are really helping each other 
Um, so one of the main criteria that we use for selection in our community is the spirit of service. So people who are there to really support each other. And it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's really magical once you're inside the community where you ask somebody for a finger, they give you an arm. You know, it's, it's really, I was as a fellow first, because I joined the company first as a fellow uh, in one of our programs, I was, I was totally blown away by this. And I come from a background of building community that was called literally the family for seven years where people were <laughs> like family. And I was still mind blown by, by this community. So I guess that's kind of our, our wedge is the, the community aspect. That's great. Yes. And as a fellow myself, I can tell that that's true. This is not a marketing slogan. The community is really powerful at, at, at on deck. So that's great. Great to hear that. Um, and the next question for you is more about trends, right? Uh, would love to get to understand if, um, if you have some new trends for university students that you've seen emerge uh, during the pandemic and that you think will stay once uh, things go back to normal in, in a quote unquote, uh, yeah, new normal in, in, in the post pandemic uh, uh, world. So a, any new trends that you guys have seen over the past uh, 12 months uh, that, that were interesting or that, that caught your eyes? Um, maybe one. Yeah. And Charlotte, do you want to go? I thought you. Go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Okay. I just uh, saw one thing. So obviously the, the distance learning, it, it's uh, an evidence, but um, universities and business school are trying to call little school or little bootcamp like Econoclast or like uh, um, tech, uh, tech bootcamp uh, to provide a little um, a little bootcamp inside the school. So yeah. I think it's it's super important because because for the moment they are a little bit stuck in their situation because they are too big, they are too like it's super complicated to move to do a new program and stuff. And so they are they are trying to to call uh, some new school like us. And I think it's a really good move. Uh, we can like stay um, in, in the market. Interesting. So more partnerships, more flexibility from, from universities on the distance learning. Cool. And Charlotte, yeah. any thoughts? So like uh, the idea of an on-demand uh, education, like I think I start to understand that uh, it's a competitive area to choose where you're going to study. And you students so you need to give a very personalized education a hybrid education like you have to give online courses and uh, physical courses because now you want to follow courses wherever uh, you are and uh, whenever you you are you want sorry mm -hmm. so i think this on-demand uh, side is important and also everything is going digital like uh, students they uh, are used to uh, the mobile phone and i think more and more schools uh, need to um, concentrate all um, services all uh, ways of communication uh, at the same place, for example, an app uh -huh. or a website uh, when you, where you can access uh, all your grades, uh, all uh, your, I don't know, your classes. So, of having uh, one tool, uh, digital, uh, to get access to everything. So on demand education and uh, uh, tools to have all your students' life at the same place. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. And, and yourself, Erika? Have you seen any new trends or yeah, something that that that, that was uh, that wasn't here 12, 12 months ago and that you think is now here and will stay? Yeah, it's hard to kind of follow up with that. They've pretty much covered it, but I would say that there are two trends outside of ed tech that I see yeah. that I'm I'm excited to see how they impact education, which are the first one is the creator economy. You have so many young people. Uh, that are you know building their personal brands, they're building their own small communities, that are monetizing them in certain ways, and you know in that in, in face of that, you know you wonder you know what is what is education for? Like what is that? What is what purpose is that serving when I can already do so much? And the second trend um, is the, the no code or low code tools, where anybody can uh, can create a product and a product that can scale to a certain extent, um, you know by themselves, and, and you can just build a company without having to go to a developer or anything like that. So I'm excited to see how those, you know, impact people in universities who are building side projects and, and doing things, you know, whether as a creator or building uh, new products with no code tools. So cool. kind of a bit of a tangent, but uh, also interesting. No, but uh, that's fine. That's a perfect link to the next question, which is uh, what excites, uh, what excites you about the future of the higher ed space? Um, how do you see the, this, this space evolving in the next uh, in the next five 
to 10 years? Uh, is it around pricing? Is it about uh, uh, format? Is it about uh, modular, uh, I don't know, uh, education? Is uh, Yeah, we'd love to, to get your thoughts here. If, 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 uh, if there is something particular that, that, that excites you guys about the, the future of the higher ed space. Okay, um, so me, my dream is um, the the head of the diploma. So I'm okay. sure we is like long life education when uh, all your life you need to learn new jobs because the, the life um, is, I mean, the, uh, you need to learn a new job every five years. I have the, the feeling that it's moving too, too, too fast. And so, for the future, I really hope uh, the, the the power of the diploma is going to decrease and the power of uh, real capacities, uh -huh. capacities and skills is going to increase. But I, I, I have this, this feeling, I don't know if you feel that, girls, but I think it's in this move. Yeah, I completely yeah. Yeah, and I think you're completely right, Marie, because uh, we know now that uh, students that are currently studying, they will change at least 10 times um, they will have, sorry, 10 different jobs. And I think uh, with this uh, statistic, we know that the diploma won't matter because every new job, you will have to learn new skills. So I completely agree with you. And also, I'm very excited about the power of digital to scale education. Uh, for example, if you are a student in Africa now and you are a top mm -hmm. student, your dream is to come to Europe and to go to Oxford, Cambridge, uh, or I don't know, uh, Harvard in the US. And I think you could uh, have the, the right and the power to stay uh, and to go wherever you are, uh, you want, sorry, and, uh, and uh, get the top class education. And I think this is uh, allowed uh, by uh, digital education. And so I also think about the power of scalability and the fact yeah. that many, many students in the world, they won't have to go specific building in a very expensive uh, town. They will be able to learn the, the best uh, skills uh, uh, in the world going whatever the, they, they want. So I think this is also very exciting. That's cool. So we are talking about accessibility and credentialing, essentially. So er Eric yeah. and on, on deck would be really happy about that, I guess, especially or because <laughs> this is what you guys do. I guess. So I don't know. What, what yeah. are your thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I mean, to kind of put the bow on this beautiful yeah. kind of uh, basket of knowledge that we put together here, <laughs> I think that the, yeah, that when we're talking about diplomas, what we're actually talking about is credentials, right? And so the problem is that the credentials are, are today um, held up by a small amount of gatekeepers. And I don't think we can get rid of the credential because as human beings, we are, you know, our brain is like a problem solving machine and we like shortcuts. We, we like to say like, okay, I know that this person is good because they did this. Like we, we yeah. like credentials it, it, and we, we have those shortcuts in, in our head anyway. I think that the, the real thing is like, how do we scale that and make it accessible to more, more, more people? And, and that is kind of what we're doing at Onec. We are, we have this global community of thousands of fellows and they come from, I think, 70 countries today. Uh, and we have, you know, fellows in, in, uh, in Singapore, in, in uh, Bangalore, in, in Nigeria and in so many other places. And, and, you know, to, to answer Lot's point, you know, digital mm -hmm allows us to do that to have all these people be part of the same community actually that is that is global yeah. and um and people people stand out within the community because of what they bring to the table and to to quote you know marie uh is what, what they have done and what they are capable of building and their skills so yeah for sure i agree with everything uh said above and, and super excited to, to 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 see a lot more democratization of a lot of these things that have been held by it by it by a small number of people so far Cool. And well, I hope Mary's dreams comes true, right? The end of the diploma era. <laughs> That's, uh... I will never stop. I will ne never stop my fight. <laughs> okay, well, noted, noted. Um, guys, one last question, which is really the bonus question is, um, if you were a dean of a top European university, so say Sorbonne, Oxford, Dauphin, what, um, what would be your top priority for the next few years and diploma i guess i don't know hiring hire marie <laughs> <laughs> my god i'm so redundant but um no i, I will i will uh, add um to add the practice um in in the curriculum i really think okay. it's super important to learn by practice and it's mm -hmm. it's the same as when you drive a car when you drive you know where you go you know how to do it mm -hmm. when you are the passenger 
you just never remember the road. So it's just so evident. I, I don't know why it's still why it's still like that. You are here on the chair just listening to someone. It's it's so stupid in, in 21 in 21. So yeah, I I I I would um I would have some practice definitely. Yeah, practice no, to, to make the curriculum way more practical. Uh, yeah, practical. Yeah. Okay. Practical. Yeah. yeah. Learning yeah. by doing. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Plus one to that project based learning, just more less prescriptive entrepreneurship programs, and and just give more freedom to to the students to to explore and learn together. That's cool. And yourself, and Charlotte, any thoughts if you were dean, yeah. the dean of of, the, of Sorbonne tomorrow, what would you do? I would love to be a dean, uh, David. And I think I, I uh, teach your workforce because um, all the time the university, the schools, they invest in the tools, in the digital tools, in the students, uh, in the campus, but they don't invest in the teachers. So I think the, the, um, we need to, to help teachers to learn how to use these digital tools, even if they are 30 years old and very geek. You have to unif uniformize the way your teachers use these tools because uh, sometimes there is a discrimination based on uh, uh, how young your teacher is. Uh, so I think really you have to invest in the formation uh, uh, in the education of teachers and also uh, you have to it's a, um, a better link between the professional world and the subjects in universities that are very um, uh, based on research, for example, sociology, anthropology, history. It's a subject that when you study them at university, you are a student, you don't know uh, what uh, uh, type of job you will do after that. So I think as a university, yeah. you, you, your role, your job is to create a link between the professional world and the subject uh, your students uh, study and love because it's so bad when you've been uh, studying uh, history for four years uh, to discover that you can't work uh, with a degree in history and you can i have a very good friend that is working at ubisoft after a degree in history and that helped design video games uh, based on this so i think the role of uh, a dean is to uh, create links between wo uh, worlds that's cool wow Okay, so I hope we have some deans in, in, in the audience here taking some notes. But that's uh, it will be it will be a so called university with Buzz Up Street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, let, let's open it to the floor. Uh, do we have yeah, we have a few questions, don't we? Yes, we have one. So Ambroise is asking. So hi Ambroise. So how do you see the development of university partnerships with private institutions? Um, in Europe. So in Europe, the market is quite small for now compared to the to other markets like the US or India, where there are, la where there are large market players such as 2U, uh, Emeritus and so on. Um, do you see any European market player emerging in that field? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So it's the question is really about the development of university partnerships with private institutions. Just uh, just like what you're doing, Mary, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, with a few uh, French uh, schools. Um, so yeah, w w what's your take on that, guys? Uh, do you think that that will become more uh, uh, that will be more common in the in the coming in the in the coming uh, um, years? Yeah, me. I really think from my from my part because a lot of business school are talking with us uh, and asking um, if we can do like one week or even one month in the new university. For example, in a, a master of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, it's it's super important the to learn how to sell, and so yeah, we have a lot of solicitation. I. I don't know if um, in several years it's gonna be like a, a big, big market in Europe. I'm, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, for the moment, uh, for for example, uh, the top five school, they yeah. um, they take approximately four to five years to um, to to work on one program. Yeah. So. Sure. For example, if they want to do a master of business development and they are starting now, the program is going to be available in five years. So that's that's um, an evidence to work with Econoclast, work with I don't know Hironac and and yeah. and this stuff. But for for us, uh, we are a bit a concurrent. Uh, we are a bit like a competitor. So 
it's super i don't know it's a fine line okay but that, yeah. that's interesting and, and uh and charlotte any thoughts there do, do you think yeah. this will become a more uh, a more robust trend in the in the coming years yeah i think so because um it's very com complementary to have a shorter uh, way of uh, learning um i was thinking about for example uh, le wagon which is partnering yeah. um with uh, local schools in africa in order to help them help them um setting up uh, coding uh, tracks uh, how to learn uh, the code and i think yeah. uh, it's going to maybe uh, be a stronger trend uh in uh, in countries from africa because they don't have uh, maybe uh, as much as schools uh, as we do in uh, in europe and i think in europe uh, schools have to understand that uh, it's not a competition it's a, it's a, it's a way of improving and having uh, shorter tracks uh, using uh, experts like uh, marie and uh, many other uh, actors in the sector so so i have big hopes but uh, i think it will yeah. take a bit of time uh, uh, in europe sure Okay, and Erika, do, do you see on deck partnering with some local universities around the world uh, to offer programs, or, or this is perhaps that's a tricky question? I don't know if you can share about that, but uh, but it's is it something on your roadmap or not at all? Well, I guess as we launch more programs for people earlier in their careers, like we just launched on the Catalyst, which is for people from you know around three years of experience. So so maybe then, um, but but so far because our focus is so so. Uh, you know, so much later, we don't really, you know, source people from, from universities or don't have a lot, but, but why not? I mean, I don't, I just don't see, you know, to Mary's point, when working with the universities, well, I was at the family, we did a lot of things for universities, just um, when they were working on project-based things or entrepreneurship boot camps, and, and it, it just so, it's such a, um, strike, a stark difference uh, in terms of, you know, way of working, the deadlines are so much longer, it's just, it's just so slow. That you you're left wondering you know like is this even is this even worth it? But yeah, um, yeah it's uh, why not? Okay, cool. And there is one 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 last question from uh, the audience. So it's um, Michael or Michel, I don't know Michael Renou, I guess, and he's asking about uh, uh, what are your views on cohort based courses? How do you see their potential to enrich, challenge the current offerings online and offline versus MOOCs as well? So yeah, a, a, any thoughts on the cohort base? I mean, uh, on deck is the is the expert. Yeah, here, so. I feel like this question is, is very pointed at me. Yeah. But um, yeah, so basically the, the thing with MOOCs is that you know completion rates historically have been very low, and you, we we are ultimately as you know human beings, we're social animals. Like we do everything better together, and that's why kind of the cohort. I mean, co a cohort base um, course offers you the opportunity to add that the community layer, but also have this um, create this journey for the people who are in your program that they share together and they go on this journey together and they have a, a common objective and that just really strengthens uh, the value proposition so i expect to see a lot more uh yeah. cohort based um courses and, and and there's definitely you know room for for both you know having it's the coursera types where it's just you know go at your own pace and, 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 and learn new things and, 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 and a lot more of, of the other, which is actually resembles more um, the actual university experience. Got it. Any thoughts, Mary, since you're, you're, you're running cohort based, uh, uh, well, Econoclass is a cohort based uh, course, so. Yeah, on physical, uh, it's super hard to not to have cohorts. Uh, actually, but online we are doing it, doing it. We don't have a cohort. And uh, to um, to answer to Erica also, we have a Slack, and so they can uh, exchange and stuff and ask questions uh, when they when they are stuck uh, in an exercise, for example. But that's true. It's it's um, it's easier to create some links between people and to create a strong communities when you have cohort. Uh, so we are working on coaching right now. So mm -hmm. they are not in cohort, but uh, at one time on Friday at midday, they can all meet and all talk, have lunch, and we have a dedicated coach. We can um, uh, help them uh, to solve their, their problems, their sales problems. But that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is, yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, I completely agree with you guys. It's, I really believe in in, in the power of, of people studying and working together because it creates accountability and it helps with um, with the motivation 
side of things as well because while being on the MOOCs, that's why the completion rates are so are so low. But if when we are we studying with with peers, you feel kind of responsible, and, and this human layer uh, is is clearly um, an interesting way to 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 make the learning experience a bit more fun. So. So, yeah, and just to add to that to yeah. that last point that I think that there's also a mix where you can have the best of both worlds where you can have maybe like a cohort based on what experience where you bring everybody together at the same time and then everybody just kind of follows their own journey after that but you still have that kind of core community base of like these are the people that I that I know closely and that I can always go back to in case I, I get lost so I think that there we'll see a lot of different flavors of, of this yeah that's that that's great thank you guys and one last question from quentin dumonté uh so the he's asking about pricing so what about the pricing of courses in a globalized market any new business models um from what I, yeah from what i see on my side and i'm speaking with a lot of startups uh, it's yeah. either you paying for a, a full boot camp so you know you're going to be trained for like i don't know a, uh, three months or 20 courses so you either paying for the number of classes or uh, for a, a time frame uh, and sometimes you can have like a um, license if it's uh, on the platform and then you can like pay for example like a monthly fees but i don't see like any new super trends in the in the the pricing of courses mainly it's uh, you pay uh, at once or you pay uh, by courses but maybe uh, Marie and Erika will have a, a different point of view. But uh, on this side, I don't see a lot of uh, innovation. Um, yeah, my point, I have the impression that uh, ISA is growing so much. Um, mm. in, in Europe, we are the very first, I mean, to, do, to try to do the same. Um, but it was so like uh, unknown uh, until two years ago. And I'm so grateful uh, for, for that model because it, it can allow a lot of people um, with money, without money, to have access to uh, excellent uh, education. Um, and uh, yeah, we are trying to do a lot of com communication on this model so a lot of people can have access to very good school. Yeah, it completely ties with what you guys were saying before on the... Uh, affordability and accessibility uh, yeah. to uh, to to the educate right, to the education uh, space so so yeah e e erica anything you would like to add on on the pricing oh. yeah i mean there's um difference i i, I mean I agree that that uh, to, to marie's point like i say is where great innovation in the space and that we you know we're able to see so many you know people like opening access to to so many new people um by you know having income share agreements, but I think that um, well I, I, on that what we've tried to do on that front is to have so basically we have this scholarship program that is funded by alumni, so it's not a it's not an income share agreement it's it's a pay forward kind of setup where people um, who've done the program and who have received scholarships or not but who just want to help other people be able to, to join the program can donate and then we match the donations every year up to one million dollars, and so that that program has been has been very successful and. And in terms of you know business models, I yeah I think that income share agreements is you know has its challenges where you know Lambda mm -hmm. School in the U.S. they had problems with people actually getting jobs because uh, their, their developers were perceived as you know maybe lower quality or maybe more risky and more junior etc. So so they actually were very innovative last year to launch the internship program where they place people at the schools and then they pay for the for the internship. And then at the end, if the company decides to hire the intern, they pay the, the Landa school back uh, for, for whatever um, it costs. So yeah, I think that we'll, we'll still see some fine tuning in those models to make sure that they are success-based and outcome oriented in certain cases. And, and there's, there's a long way to go in that, in that sense to, to create the right incentives and alignment. No, sure, yeah, financing options. Yeah, to, to the question, to, to, your, to your questions. Um... Quentin, it's really about about the fine business models. Are, what we've seen really at Bright Eye is um, innovation around financing options to make uh, because while well, providing uh, while well, providing an education or a program or a certificate or whatever for free, 
you are not there yet, right? Unless you go to a public university, but otherwise it's really around making it extremely accessible by being flexible on 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 on, on the payment and the tuition fee. So that's that's been one way. Is it is this a new business model? I don't know, but uh, but mm -hmm. that's at least one way that the, the, the current players are, are tackling this this issue. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah. also just yeah. add one last point. There are some startups actually working on this, how to help students to get as many public funded, public funded uh, private fundings. For example, a company that is uh, called uh, Unly, U-N-L-Y. And yeah. uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a trend also uh, for startups, how to help students to finance their, uh, their university. But, uh, but yeah, I, I hope they are, they are. I hope they are net tech. They are a net tech France member. Huh? Yes, they Good are. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's great, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was um, a real treat to have you on, and thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, I took a lot of notes, so le learning a lot from you, and I hope you you, you enjoyed uh, being here. And um, and yeah, so we can move on to the to the next uh, to the to the next um, conversation. Thanks thank again. You. Bye. It was great Bye. to see everybody. Bye.